So I have two goals for uh, the resident uh, noon lecture today. One is to um, review with you the diagnosis and treatment of uh, some selected anterior pituitary disorders. But the second is to show you why endocrinology is so much fun uh, and really enjoyable, uh, so especially that you ought to consider. So there are two basic questions you need to ask and answer about any pituitary lesion. It doesn't matter whether it's a tumor, whether it's a, uh, a hemorrhage, uh, um, a supercellar uh, cranial pharyngioma. There are two things you need to answer. One, is there excess secretion of one or more pituitary hormones? In other words, is the pituitary lesion functional? Um, and secondly, uh, and these are not mutually exclusive, is there a deficient secretion of one or more pituitary hormones because of the compressive mass effects or the vascular effects uh, of the lesion uh, of the pituitary? So as you'll see, we're gonna, we're gonna deal with both of those uh, issues as we go through the talk today. So in terms of functional pituitary adenomas, I'd like to show this very old slide from surgical series back in the 1970s. And the reason is in the 1970s, uh, we didn't have medical treatments for pituitary tumors. So they were all taken out surgically. Uh, and when they were taken out, they were all looked at histologically. So we could better tell what the true incidence of functional tumors were by these kinds of series where uh, every tumor that we saw was, was removed and analyzed. And if you look at these series, they, they are pretty much in agreement that the major uh, pituitary adenoma uh, that secretes hormones is a prolactinoma, secreting prolactin about 40% uh, of the time. Uh, and the second is growth hormone at around 17 to 20% of the time. Um, ACTH uh, comes in third, and, and uh, all the others, TSH, uh, gonadotropins, uh, uh, are far behind. Now, non-functioning tumors uh, at about 25% uh, are uh, actually the second most common kind of tumor after prolactinomas. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on prolactin secreting and growth hormone secreting tumors uh, as epitomizing our approach toward uh, diagnosis and treatment of pituitary tumors. Um, and uh, ACTH will be covered in uh, your talks on uh, Cushing's disease and, and uh, uh, cortisol hypersecretion. So in diagnosing any disease, you need to know the clinical presentation of, of how patients might present with that disease. And for hyperprolactinemia, it differs in females and in males. So in females, the majority uh, have a combination of amenorrhea and galactorrhea, uh, but some have uh, amenorrhea alone. Uh, and particularly um, um, in postmenopausal females, without estrogen, you, there, you won't see any galactorrhea. So uh, amenorrhea uh, alone uh, would be seen, but of course, if they're postmenopausal, uh, they're going to be amenorrhea anyway. All the rest are relatively uncommon presentations. And of note, if you look down at visual field defect, a mass effect uh, uh, caused by the size of the adenoma, in females very low uh, at less than 2% uh, of presentations. In terms of picking up uh, prolactinoma, uh, a single prolactin level is really uh, the best uh, test. Uh, in this uh, series of uh, patients with secondary amenorrhea, meaning amenorrhea that uh, occurs after menarche and the initiation of menses, um, a uh, single prolactin level was elevated 17% of the time. So that's a pretty good pickup. Uh, and now the uh, uh, OPTYN physicians are, are well aware of this, and a prolactin level is uh, pretty much the uh, first test that's uh, obtained in any female presenting with uh, either uh, oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea that's, that's secondary. Uh, and many of our consults for prolactinomas now come from OBGYN because they are doing this uh, on a regular basis. Now, the presentation of men would obviously be different since uh, males don't have menstrual periods, they can't have amenorrhea, and they rarely, rarely have sufficient breast tissue to manifest galactorrhea. So we don't see those in men. We do see reproductive effects, however, in about half uh, of the males to have hypogonadism with loss of libido and, the, and erectile dysfunction. Uh, but notice further down on the list, the, the second and third most common symptoms are mass effects from size of the tumor, both headaches uh, and visual failure, meaning visual field abnormalities. And the reason for this differential presentation 
is that males typically present later than females because they don't uh, go to uh, their physician with complaints of loss of libido, or libido erectile dysfunction. At least uh, they haven't uh, historically. I think that's changing a little bit now uh, in, in younger populations, but typically they don't, which means that whereas a female is very attuned to abnormalities in her menstrual cycle, what that means is that females typically present when the prolactinoma is small, what we call the microadenoma, uh, too small to have mass effects on vision or neurological effects. Whereas males historically have presented with uh, uh, prolactinomas later, um, meaning that the tumors are bigger. And if they're bigger, uh, they're more likely to manifest the mass effects on both visual and neurological symptoms. So what does high prolactin actually do to cause these uh, effects on the reproductive axis? Well, what it does is it damps the peaks of the gonadotropins LH and FSH. This is not uh, a prolactinoma. These are females with anorexia nervosa. And you can see in the top panel, there is a cyclical secretion of LH, which occurs normally. It's about every 60 to 90 minutes, there's a pulse of LH. And you need that uh, uh, cyclicity uh, for normal ovarian as well as testicular function. When anorexics lose weight down to 25% uh, below ideal body weight, you lose that cyclicity, uh, that periodicity of, of pulsatile secretion, uh, and as a result, uh, they become amenorrheic. Uh, prolactin does the same thing. It eliminates these peaks of LH and FSH. Uh, why is it set up to do that? Well, we think it is evolutionarily protective um, <clears throat> because the worst time for a female to be fertile and become pregnant is immediately following uh, uh, another pregnancy uh, because that's the time period at which she uh, will be, uh, at least uh, in, the, uh, in the historical times before the availability of commercial formulas, uh, she will need to be breastfeeding uh, the first infant. So it would not be uh, evolutionarily adva advantageous to survival of infants if females became pregnant uh, immediately after a, a recent delivery. Uh, and this is one reason postulated for why prolactin has this effect to dampen the pulsatile secretion and shut off basically uh, normal regulation of ovarian function. So in differentiating um, uh, or dif making the differential diagnosis of, of a prolactinoma, uh, you have to first exclude physiological as well as other forms of pathological hyperplactinemia. Physiological ones are listed here. The main one is pregnancy, which of course uh, is accompanied by hyperplactinemia in order to prepare the breast for uh, breastfeeding of, of, the, uh, of the infant. Uh, the rest of these are not likely to be a confound in terms of your differential diagnosis, except for nipple stimulation, uh, which means that you should not get a prolactin level uh, immediately or in close proximity to doing a, a breast examination of your patient. More, more problematical are the pathological causes of hyperplactinemia other than a prolactinoma, because many drugs, and particularly um, uh, drugs uh, used for psychotherapy, uh, but also metoclopramide and, and uh, H2 blockers uh, can cause a secondary prolactin elevation. So you need to know you're not dealing with that. Um, Non-functional cellular masses uh, can cause hyperlactins, and we'll discuss that uh, specifically a bit later. Renal failure, because prolactin is secreted by the, excreted by the kidneys. Uh, primary hypothyroidism, because TSH uh, can also, uh, TRH can also stimulate uh, uh, prolactin secretion. And rarely, chest wall irritation, um, which might be caused by uh, herpes zoster. Uh, but once you have a high prolactin, the um, uh, differential diagnosis is pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, the patient should have sustained hyperprolactinemia and elevated prolactin uh, at least times two uh, without a breast exam within one hour of the blood sample because of the nipple stimulation effects we talked about previously. I say on this slide 20 because that used to be our upper limit for prolactin. Now it depends on the lab. Some labs uh, will have an upper limit of 24, 25, 26. So whatever the upper limit is of the lab uh, that's doing the testing. And once you've confirmed hyperprolactinemia, then pituitary imaging is indicated. Uh, it should be an MRI, not a CT. An MRI is much more sensitive uh, to pick up uh, small uh, pituitary lesions uh, down to a resolution of one to two millimeters. Uh, dynamic contrast imaging simply means that uh, images are obtained within 
minutes after injection of the gadolinium contrast. You don't have to specify that anymore. If you simply order a pituitary MRI, uh, our radiology department will do the appropriate uh, uh, pituitary protocol uh, for the most uh, sensitive imaging. Uh, you should look at the uh, MRIs and get familiar with, at least uh, our fellows uh, do, uh, with what a normal pituitary looks like. And so a normal pituitary looks like this, this white area in the center of the photograph. It lies above the sphenoid sinus, which is the black hole there. Um, it lies in between the two carotid arteries, which are shown as the black um, uh, areas there inside the cavernous sinus. If on the right cut, you can see the pituitary stalk connecting it to the base of the brain. And right here is the optic chiasm um, uh, uh, right above the, uh, of the uh, cella, which encompasses the pituitary. So notice that the pituitary here is white. The rest of the brain is gray. This is a post-contrast image. Um, and the reason the pituitary is white on the, uh, after contrast is the pituitary has no blood-brain barrier. Uh, the brain does, so contrast is kept out of the brain, but not the pituitary. So you can always tell what the pituitary is simply by making sure you're looking at a post-contrast image, uh, in which case it will be clearly differentiated from the rest of the brain. So that was a normal pituitary. Uh, what's an abnormal pituitary? Well, there are different, uh, there are different uh, indications that the, that the pituitary is abnormal. Uh, an upward convex surface is one. The surface of the pituitary if you draw a line across the two uh, upper loops of the carotid artery, that should be pretty much the top surface of the pituitary. And usually it actually dips uh, down a little bit into the, uh, uh, into the uh, diaphragm, into the cella. So it, we, we say at that point it's concave downwards. This one is convex upwards, suggesting there is a mass inside the pituitary. And here's the optic chiasm. Normally there's about a one centimeter um, area between of CSF between the top of the pituitary optic chiasm. In this case, you have optic chiasmal encroachment. The pituitary is encroaching on the chiasm. It doesn't mean it's compressing the chiasm at this point, but it's getting close. Uh, and rather than a homogeneous white area of the pituitary, this is heterogeneous, um, and it suggests that there is an abnormality in the cella, uh, whether you can see a, a definite tumor or not. So again, normal MRI, I just showed you that. Uh, you have no problem saying this is not a normal uh, pituitary on the MRI. Uh, this is a big lesion. Uh, that's a macroadenoma greater than one centimeter. Uh, when you see that on an MRI, and the best images to see uh, pituitary adenomas are on the coronal views shown here, uh, then obviously there's no question that there's a pituitary uh, adenoma. But it's not always that easy. Sometimes it's more subtle, especially with the microadenomas less than one millimeter, less than uh, one centimeter. Uh, here is an example of a pituitary. It looks homogeneous here, but here it is hypoenhancing. Uh, it is pushing upward on the surface of the, uh, of the pituitary, uh, and that is a pituitary microadenoma. <clears throat> Importantly, you have to use different criteria for a pituitary lesion than for the rest of the brain. So when you're looking at an MRI and you're looking uh, for a pituitary tumor, for a, uh, a neurological tumor inside the brain, you're actually looking for an area of increased contrast inside uh, uh, the non-contrast brain. Since the pituitary has no blood-brain barrier, the opposite rules apply here. You're looking for uh, an area of decreased enhancement within the normally white, bright, post-contrast pituitary. Uh, so again, you're looking uh, for uh, different uh, characteristics on the MRI for a brain tumor uh, versus a pituitary tumor. Now, in terms of interpreting your prolactin level, I said you need the prolactin to be elevated uh, uh, two times above the upper limits of normal. Um, what actually is the prolactin level that uh, identifies by itself that this is a prolactinoma? Well, we take a cutoff of about 200. And why is that? Because 200 is about the maximum uh, amount uh, of prolactin that a normal pituitary can secrete. Uh, and the maximal secretion occurs uh, at the end of pregnancy. You can see the increased uh, prolactin secretion throughout the pregnancy, uh, peaking uh, uh, during in the last uh, trimester. So once you see a pituitary or hyperprolactinemia that's over 200, then typically that means that's a prolactinoma because the normal pituitary cannot get to levels that high, regardless of whether it's a drug-induced or hypothyroidism-induced or pregnancy-induced. So we take that as a cutoff. Obviously, you know, 201 is not uh, going to cut it. 
but if it's significantly above 200, then you can reliably conclude that's a prolactinoma uh, and not a uh, non-prolactinary uh, prolactin um, prolactinoma caused by hyperprolactinemia. Now here's where we have to uh, bring up an important caveat that I mentioned before. Not all cases of hyperprolactinemia with a mass in the cell are prolactinomas. So macroadenomas with prolactin levels under that 200 cutoff should be uh, considered to represent non-functional adenomas with pituitary stock compression. Why is that important? So, you know, this is what controls the, um, this is what controls prolactin secretion. Dopamine coming down these long pituitary portal vessels and hitting the prolactin cells suppresses secretion of prolactin from the pituitary. If you've got a mass that's compressing these vessels, impairing the delivery of dopamine to the prolactin cells, such as a uh, cutting the stalk or a mass that compresses the stalk, then you're not going to suppress the prolactin and you will get an elevation of prolactin, even though the tumor itself up here compressing the pituitary stalk is not making prolactin, but it's causing a secondary elevation because of this impairment of delivery of dopamine uh, to the anterior pituitary. And that becomes important in how you both treat and follow cases of hyperprolactinemia with a pituitary adenoma uh, that we'll talk about shortly. But before we get into treatment, what's important with any disease, uh, particularly in endocrinology, is to know when you don't need to treat. Um, and basically, there are many cases where you don't need to treat a pituitary uh, prolactinoma. And in this case, series uh, uh, of about 140 cases uh, followed uh, anywhere from two and a half to uh, uh, seven and a half years. Uh, the evidence that the tumor was actually growing or increasing in size only occurred in roughly a, about 10% of the tumors. Uh, and so if you're not concerned about the prolactin level itself needing to be treated, uh, and usually you will treat that in a, in a, in a premenopausal female, then in a postmenopausal female, where you're not concerned about the effects of the hyperlactin anymore, if the patient's amenorrhea and can have galactorrhea, you don't have to treat many of those. Many of those you don't have to treat, and we simply follow them uh, with MRI. If we do need to treat them, uh, then uh, the old approach that I showed you in those earlier surgical series was to take them the prolactinoma out surgically, uh, and that typically is done uh, by the neurosurgeons. Uh, through an approach uh, through the nose, either translabial or, or uh, transnasal, go through the sphenoid sinus uh, into the diaphragm cella, uh, where uh, you will encounter, if you're lucky, the pituitary tumor bulging out, uh, and it can be corrected out. Now, how successful is pituitary surgery? Our, our neurosurgeons at, at Georgetown are very good, um, uh, and they do a great job uh, when they need to uh, remove pituitary tumors uh, uh, through the transnasal approach. Most of the approaches now are transnasal because that enables use of a flexible uh, scope, uh, just like an endoscope, uh, so that they can actually look above the diaphragm cella, be sure they're not getting into uh, brain tissue with their resection. Uh, but what is the, the success rate back when it used to be done for uh, all prolactinomas? Well, the success rate was crucially dependent upon the prolactin level. If the prolactin levels were low, less than uh, 200, success rates between 80 and 95%, but the higher the prolactin, the lower the success rate. And that basically is a function of the tumor size. Higher prolactins typically mean larger tumors, larger tumors are more difficult to resect. But that all changed with this drug, uh, bromocryptine, uh, trade name Parladel. It's a dopamine agonist. And as I uh, indicated to you before, the reason that it works is because dopamine in the brain is what suppresses uh, prolactin secretion. So if you give a dopamine agonist, you bypass the dopamine that's not getting, that, that, that is not effective uh, coming from the uh, hypothalamus, but you're giving pharmacological doses that affects the uh, tumor tissue, then you can uh, uh, inhibit prolactin secretion uh, very effectively. Uh, and this shows, um, uh, some data uh, looking at the first dopamine agonist bromocryptine, you can see the initial suppression of prolactin down just about to the normal range in most cases. We now have a second agent, cabergoline, which is our uh, treatment of choice. 
uh, because it does a better job of suppressing the prolactin. It can be taken uh, once a week rather than twice a day or three times a day as with bromocryptine. has very little side effects uh, uh, relative to uh, what bromocryptine does. So if you see our patients with prolactinomas being treated, you're typically going to see them on cabergoline uh, rather than bromocryptine. And the nice thing about treating with a dopamine agonist is it doesn't just suppress the prolactin. So obviously, if you suppress the prolactin, the galacteria that the patient might have goes away because that's caused by the prolactin. And typically, menstrual periods return to normal cyclicity because you're no longer inhibiting the pulsatile L8 secretion. But there's an additional benefit, which is the dopamine agonist has an effect to decrease the size of the prolactinoma. And this was first seen in patients uh, uh, who were treated with bromocryptin back in the 70s and 80s. And you can see uh, in this case, there's a, uh, a visual field defect on the left. It's not completely cured with a surgical resection, but after treatment with bromocryptin, it, the visual fields are completely normal. Uh, and once we found that, then we said, well, why don't we just treat with bromocryptin alone? Uh, and that's shown here uh, by temporal hemianopsia. Uh, bromocryptin therapy reduces the visual field defect and eventually uh, completely normalizes the vision. And that's because 90 to 95% of prolactinomas will respond to a dopamine agonist uh, with uh, decreases in size, oftentimes dramatic decreases in size. So dopamine agonists are the treatment of choice for prolactinomas, regardless of the size of the prolactinoma uh, and regardless of the neurolog neurological or visual manifestations. So if the, uh, uh, if the hyperprolactinemia is idiopathic, treatment is a dopamine agonist, microadenoma, macroadenoma, dopamine agonist, and even supercellular extension dopamine agonist. What that means practically is you should not let a patient with a pituitary tumor and hyperplect and, and uh, with a pituitary tumor uh, go to neurosurgery without knowing what the prolactin level is first. Because if the prolactin level is elevated, the treatment is not neurosurgery, the treatment is uh, medical therapy with a dopamine agonist. Now let's get back to this caveat, not all cases of hyperplectinemia or plactinomas, some are non-functional adenomas of the pituitary stock. So, so you have a patient with a large pituitary tumor, their plectin is 100, um, and you decide to treat that patient with a dopamine agonist. You are going to suppress the prolactin level because dopamine will suppress the prolactin regardless of, of the cause of the elevated prolactin. Uh, but you will not shrink the tumor. And that means if you're only following the prolactin level, you may miss a tumor that's getting progressively larger uh, because uh, the prolactin will stay suppressed, but the tumor won't shrink. So to follow up pituitary tumors that are prolactinomas, you have to treat, uh, you have to follow both the prolactin level with your treatment, make sure that you're on a, on a correct dose of uh, cabergoline or, or bromocryptin to really suppress the prolactin into a normal range, but also to follow MRI scans at six month to one year intervals to make sure that uh, you actually are uh, decreasing the size of the pituitary tumor, or if not, uh, that the pituitary tumor is not progressing, uh, in which case neurosurgery would be indicated. So that uh, uh, summarizes uh, our current diagnosis and, and therapy of, of prolactinomas, which again, are the most common type of pituitary tumor that you'll see. Uh, and uh, because the prolactin level is easy to get and cheap, uh, you should not hesitate to uh, uh, obtain a prolactin level in any female with uh, unexplained, otherwise unexplained menstrual irregularities, and particularly with amenorrhea, even if they don't have galactorrhea. I'm just going to skip that one. So let's move on from prolactin uh, to growth hormone. So, you know, the, the nice thing about endocrinology is we have all these fascinating uh, disease types uh, because of the effects of hormone uh, hypersecretion. Uh, so amenorrhea galactorrhea is, is one of them, uh, but the effects of excess growth hormone are even more dramatic. So to look at growth hormone regulation, again, it's made by these growth hormone uh, secreting cells in the pituitary that secrete growth hormone in response to uh, both uh, inhibitors and stimulators. Uh, they act on growth hormone receptors in the liver, and in the liver, they stimulate secretion of what we used to call somatomedin. Don't use that term much anymore. Uh, it's now uh, uh, called IGF uh, insulin-like growth factor one, which is uh, one of the major diagnostic tests you use. And it's the IGF one that stimulates uh, bone, uh, uh, bone uh, 
uh, lung bone uh, growth as well as acral bone growth. Growth hormone does have other effects independently of IGF-1. It, it affects, it raises blood glucose, worsens diabetes. Um, it affects cellular uptake of amino acids and tissue breakdown of fat. But most of the major effects of growth hormone are mediated by IGF-1. And they result in this, which is gigantism. Uh, this is one of the textbook cases uh, of gigantism, Robert Wadlow, uh, eight foot 11 inches tall, 475 pounds. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, his lifespan was before uh, the NBA, uh, really appreciated the uh, advantage of having uh, giants as centers on their team. So he couldn't capitalize upon it uh, financially. This is him with his older brother. This is his physician at the time. He died at age 22 of cardiovascular complications, uh, which is uh, one of the major metabolic uh, abnormalities in acromegaly. So I think most of you know uh, the kind of acral changes we look at. There is thickening of the skull. There is enlargement uh, of the mandible. Uh, if the pituitary tumor is enlarged, there's an enlarged pituitary fossa. Uh, big hands, big feet, you know to ask about that. Uh, this shows the uh, widening of the bones, so the phalanges in the hand. Uh, but in addition to the bone growth, there's a lot of soft tissue growth that accompanies acromegaly. So the acromegalic hand is not just a big hand. It's a big fleshy hand with a lot of soft tissue growth, uh, both uh, uh, in the fingers as well as the uh, entire palm of the hand. If you've ever uh, shaken the hand, uh, shook the hand of, uh, of a true acromegalic, uh, you won't forget the sensation of not only how big, uh, but, but how uh, fleshy that uh, hand was. There's other soft tissue enlargement, the nasolabial folds and the nose is enlarged. There is macroglossia, which can lead and often does lead to sleep apnea. And of course, you know, the acromegalic uh, uh, features uh, result in a marked disfigurement. Uh, not only is there a large skull with prognathism, coarse face, large hands and foot, typically a kyphosis from, from osteoporosis, a barrel chest, and a lot of soft thickening, thickening all over the body. So you clearly don't want your patient to get to this state. Uh, you have to make the disease earlier. Uh, this is, uh, and the way you do that is you always ask the patient to bring in old pictures if you're suggest, if you're thinking of this diagnosis. And when you do that, you, know, you can find uh, uh, this kind of change. This patient clearly is acromegalic, uh, uh, big jaw, coarse face features, big hands. And you can see that back uh, 10, 20 years ago when she was a younger woman, you can already see the nose enlargement. You can already see the prognathism and the jaw enlargement. Wasn't present when she was a kid, but somewhere between here and here, she developed a disease. And then the question is, is there enough here that you should have had suspicion back at this time? Probably not. But sometime between here and here, the diagnosis could have been picked up and should have been picked up so that she wouldn't progress to the state uh, you see in this final picture here. Um, you know, Andre the Giant, who you all know from your, your uh, college life when everyone watched Princess Bride, um, was one of the most famous acromegalics. Um, and the reason I show this slide is not to, um, you know, show his wrestling prowess, uh, but the fact that uh, this, this big man, this big giant, very powerful, he died at age 46. He, he died of uh, a uh, cardiac arrhythmia, uh, probably VTAC. Um, because of the cardiovascular complications of untreated acromegaly, which clearly kills acromegalic, uh, uh, acromegalics at a younger age than normal. So initial presentation, again, how do you make the diagnosis? Uh, there are a lot of potential uh, indicators, but you know, all of these are relatively low incidence in terms of using them to think of the diagnosis. 40% of cases are identified by what's called chance here. It means someone looked at the patient or the patient's x-ray and said, I think this patient looks a little acromegalic. We ought to get some lab testing. Uh, and so that's your job uh, as an internist, uh, as an internal medicine physician, is to have a high degree of suspicion so that you pick up cases early while they can be cured and prevent the long-term consequences, both uh, in terms of disfigurement, as well as metabolic and, and early cardiovascular death. So let me take you through a case where you might want to, uh, you might want to uh, think of uh, acromegaly. Uh, so this is, you all know Michelangelo's famous statue of David, uh, who killed uh, Goliath, uh, and Goliath clearly was an acromegalic. Don't need to show, uh, we have no pictures of him, but from the description, we know he was an acromegalic. So, you know, his, his, uh, 
his history is is uh, pretty much a, a negative. Uh, he looks like a pretty healthy uh, young man. So why would you even think of acromegaly uh, in David? Well, if you look at his head and his face, uh, there is some frontal bossing. Uh, there may be some pragmatism and maybe has a little bit of a big nose. Are those enough to say we ought to screen David uh, with an IGF-1 and a growth hormone level? Probably not by themselves. What really makes David uh, fascinating for endocrinologists who, uh, who study uh, historical endocrinology is his hands. Michelangelo, he created this statue of David with massive hands. His hands uh, are, uh, they dwarf other parts uh, of his body. And we think that the reason that Michelangelo did this uh, was to demonstrate the power of David and the reason he was able to uh, defeat uh, uh, Goliath. Uh, regardless of the reason, I'm not telling you that David had acromegaly. I would never say that. I'm telling you if I saw those hands, I'd screen him for acromegaly. And again, that's the way you make a diagnosis, have a high degree of suspicion. Once you have a suspicion of the diagnosis, how do you confirm it? Well, you get a serum growth hormone level and you get a serum IGF-1 level. Growth hormone is not very good by itself um, because it has a pulsatile secretion uh, and it can be up and down and you can both have a false elevation and uh, a miss a true elevation. So for screening, IGF-1 is preferred because it gives you a more integrated measure of growth hormone secretion over a 24 hour period. The gold standard is the uh, glucose tolerance test. Uh, which normally suppresses growth hormone to less than two, uh, we won't do this unless one of these two screening tests are abnormal. So you do those first, uh, and then if you need to, you can do the GTT. This is the problem with individual growth hormone levels. This is a normal person. This could be you. Um, but then again, you probably don't get a full night's sleep, so it's probably not you. Uh, it's up and down throughout the day. So if you measure it here, it looks looks normal. You measure it here, it looks slow. But if you measure it at the onset of deep sleep, it's going to look like that patient may have acromegaly, acromegaly but that's the normal uh, stage four deep wave sleep stimulation of growth hormone that is what is necessary for kids to grow to a normal height. That's the worst possible time to screen with the growth hormone level. So here's the uh, glucose tolerance test and, and why it's useful. So if you look down here at the growth hormone levels, all of these one, two, three, four, five, six patients have relatively normal looking growth hormone levels. However, five out of the six, 60 minutes after glucose uh, to an elevation of you know, 125 to 150 or 60, uh, suppress the growth hormone to less than two uh, versus the guy in red here, FS, who has not a particularly elevated growth hormone level, but it doesn't suppress with glucose. That is a diagnosis of acromegaly. So when you need to, that's the gold standard uh, if you can't tell by the IGF-1 or the growth hormone level. So in terms of uh, um, diagnosis, again, rely on the somatomedin or the IGF-1. Remember that it is still age specific. So you wanna use normal ranges uh, for uh, the age of, uh, of either the child or the adult uh, in terms of interpreting uh, the level here, a level of over a thousand, clearly way above the upper limits of normal. Uh, that is sufficient for a diagnosis of acromegaly. 95% uh, of cases of acromegaly are caused by a pituitary tumor. Very rare, it's caused by a tumor that secretes growth hormone releasing factor uh, that can occur uh, either in the brain or in the uh, bronchial carcinoid uh, or a pancreatic islet cell tumor less than one to 2%. So you always start off looking for a pituitary tumor because 95% of the time, that's what you're going to find. In terms of treatment, um, we also now have medical treatment for uh, acromegaly, uh, but the first treatment really is to take out the pituitary tumor. That's the only thing that is completely curative uh, for acromegaly as opposed to um, prolactinomas we use medical therapy uh, secondarily to treat um, uh, growth hormone hypersecretion that, that cannot be eliminated by a complete surgical resection of the tumor. And the way we do that is focusing on this particular peptide somatostatin. So in the hypothalamus, growth hormone releasing factor stimulates growth hormone secretion, somatostatin inhibits growth hormone secretion. So you know we can use that to design drugs that will have uh, the effect that we want. So here's somatostatin, as well as in a three-dimensional view. Uh, the problem with human somatostatin 
it's just destroyed very quickly uh, in the blood, even if you inject it, uh, which you have to because it's a peptide, it won't be, you can't use it orally. So it really isn't a very effective treatment unless you infuse it continuously. But then sandostatin or octreotide was developed because it is a somatostatin analog. And by just taking this loop here and bridging it with a cysting, you now have a compound that resists degradation, uh, can last for longer periods of time, uh, and can be used to suppress the growth hormone secretion from the tumor. And this shows some of the early studies with octreotide, uh, growth hormone secretion that's up and down after 50 micrograms of uh, octreotide, a nice suppression, but it doesn't last long enough. And then TID lasts a little bit longer and 100 TID uh, gives you a good suppression. Uh, we now have longer acting preparations of triotide, LAR, uh, lanreotide that being, can be given monthly uh, with good suppression of um, the growth hormone. But unlike prolactinomas, octreotide or lanreotide does not have a very good effect to decrease the size of the pituitary tumor. So unlike prolactinomas where uh, a dopamine agonist can uh, shrink a prolactinoma down to almost nothing, that doesn't happen with octreotide or lanreotide. Uh, they simply suppress the growth hormone secretion. So they're very effective for long-term treatment, but they don't take the place of getting rid of the initial pituitary tumor, uh, which again has to be done surgically. So very different approaches to these two functional pituitary tumors. A prolactinoma, we will always treat medically and surgery is uh, second line therapy. Uh, for growth hormone hypersecretion, surgery is first line therapy and medical treatment with a uh, somatostatin uh, analog uh, is second line therapy to, to control the growth hormone afterwards. There now is uh, uh, several other treatments we use for acromegaly. Um, there's an oral octreotide preparation called Micapsa, which has just been approved by the FDA in the last year. Um, and we now, uh, recent, not now, but for a while have had uh, a antagonist of the growth hormone receptor uh, in the liver called pegbisamon, uh, which also is very effective. So we've got good medical therapy uh, for uh, the excess growth hormone levels and to maintain growth hormone in a uh, non-pathological range in the event that surgery is not successful in curing the patient. But our primary approach is to go with surgery, try to get a cure of the patient uh, without needing uh, subsequent medical therapy. Uh, and whether that's possible or not depends totally on the size of the tumor. Uh, many growth hormone screening tumors are large macroadenomas uh, such as this. And especially if they invade the cavernous sinus on either side of the pituitary, they cannot be resected totally. Neurosurgeons will not go into the cavernous sinus to resect the tumor for obvious reasons. Once you get into cavernous sinus, uh, you open up all kinds of bleeding into the brain. Uh, it's not a good thing to do. Uh, so if we see extension of a growth hormone screening tumor into the cavernous sinus, uh, we know it can't be uh, removed entirely neurosurgically, uh, but it can be treated with uh, radiotherapy. So those patients uh, after decompression of the pituitary lesion uh, will be sent to uh, uh, Dr. Collins in, in our CyberKnife unit uh, for uh, targeted CyberKnife therapy uh, of the tumor that's in the cavernous sinus, uh, uh, which will take a few years, but, but generally we can, we can still get resolution of the growth hormone secretion then. So those are the two um, major functional uh, pituitary tumors, prolactinomas and growth hormone secreting tumors. Um, I've gone through the uh, the basics of diagnosis and, and therapy. Uh, obviously, there are some more nuanced aspects of therapy that um, you know, really need to be addressed by an endocrinologist, but you all are on the front lines in terms of making the initial diagnosis. You know, these patients are never going to get to an endocrinologist if you don't initially make the diagnosis. Uh, and that's what I encourage you to do. Uh, have high indices of suspicion uh, for both of these tumor types. And, and when you see something that looks suspicious, you know, you can get all the initial screening, uh, the prolactin level, the initial MRI, uh, the IGF-1 and the growth hormone level, um, and then consult us when, when you need us to help with uh, therapy uh, of those patients. Now, I want to close with the opposite end of the spectrum. So we've been talking about functional pituitary tumors, tumors that make too much of a pituitary hormone. Uh, but remember that pituitary tumors 
particularly when they get to be this size, the size of a macroadenoma, they can also cause hypopituitarism uh, and deficiency of pituitary hormones simply because of compression of the normal pituitary gland. So a macroadenoma is defined as any dimension of the tumor is greater than one centimeter or 10 millimeters. Once you meet that criteria, that now is a macroadenoma versus a microadenoma. And there are two major complications that have to be considered with macroadenomas. One is the so-called mass effect of the uh, tumor mass itself, and it can cause a variety of neurological problems. Uh, one is headache simply because if the tumor presses up on the dura where uh, this nerve uh, uh, pain receptors are, that can precipitate headaches, but that's a pretty uh, nonspecific symptoms. symptom. It might be caused by a pituitary tumor. Most headaches are not. Uh, if it extends backward into the pons, in the pontine area, it can cause hydrocephalus, but that's rare. The usual problem is it extends upward, hits the optic chiasm. Once it hits the optic chiasm, then it causes a loss of uh, peripheral visual fields, uh, which you know is a bitemporal hemianopsia, uh, which is what you should look for uh, if you're suspecting a, uh, a pituitary mass lesion. You know, confrontational visual fields uh, are not the most sensitive, but they can give you a clue uh, that there's something there. Uh, and then you send the patient to ophthalmology for formal visual fields to confirm that. If it extends laterally into the cranial uh, a cavernous sinus, uh, you can get ophthalmoplegia uh, of uh, nerves three, four, and six, uh, causing diplopia and, and uh, defective eye movements. And then rarely, if it extends downward through the sphingoid sinus, it can open up a rent in the base of the brain to cause a CSF leak. So all of those are mass effects have nothing to do with hormonal abnormalities. But uh, if the tumor is big enough to compress the normal pituitary, whether it is a pituitary adenoma or a craniopharyngeoma shown in this picture, it can cause deficiencies of all of the other pituitary hormones. So it can cause deficiencies of TSH and secondary hypothyroidism, secondary adrenaline deficiency, uh, dwarfism, if it occurs during childhood and impairs growth hormone secretion, obviously hypogonadism in both males and females. Uh, rarely, if it's really big, it can cause diabetes insipidus uh, because of impaired secretion of ADP from the posterior pituitary. So if you are evaluating a patient that uh, has a macroadenoma or a large lesion, you want to evaluate not only the uh, potential mass effects, but also the effects on pituitary hormone secretion. So there are two ways to do that. Uh, the most sensitive the way, the way that we don't do much anymore because uh, of uh, both uh, reimbursement as well as logistical uh, problems, is to do stimulation tests. So if you give the uh, hypothalamic hormone that causes LH and FSH secretion, that's gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH, but it's also cause, called uh, in the old days, luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone. You give that hormone and then you measure every few minutes the FSH and LH, you can see a, a normal pattern of secretion. And that tells you that the LH and FSH secreting cells in the pituitary are still intact because they can respond to GNRH. You can do the same thing more indirectly uh, for um, ACTH and growth hormone by giving the patient insulin, producing a hypoglycemia shown here, plasma glucose less than 40. Of course, we're going to do that in a controlled, monitored environment. Uh, and that will cause secretion of ACTH, which will stimulate cortisol. It'll also stimulate growth hormone. We virtually never do that anymore, though occasionally there's a reason to. Uh, because now you know that you evaluate this with an ACTH stimulation test uh, in terms of adequacy of uh, cortisol secretion. Uh, the only problem with the ACTH stim test is that it will pick up cases of both primary and secondary adrenal deficiency as long as they've been present for um, two to four weeks or longer uh, because it takes that long to suppress the hypothalamic pituitary axis. If you've got an acute um, a pituitary lesion such as a uh, hemorrhage and apoplexy into a tumor, uh, then the ACTH stim test will not be effective in picking up uh, uh, decreased cortisol secretion. Uh, and so you need to, the, to rely on the cortisol level itself. So these days we mostly just measure the end organ hormones. So you measure the free T4 and TSH, you measure the cortisol on ACTH, 
uh, you measure the gonadotropins, um, and you make a diagnosis of pituitary deficiency based on those levels. And then, of course, you replace as necessary with thyroxine, with cortisol, um, <clears throat> with uh, um, um, uh, gonadal hormones, both in, in males and females. Uh, growth hormone, mostly in children that you, with short stature, uh, but there is an indication for a treatment of adult growth hormone deficiency that we sometimes use, uh, and so that uh, uh, you will see uh, some adults being treated with growth hormone, not just growth hormone deficient children. The only hormone we never replace is prolactin because there's really not an indication to do that except uh, in postpartum females who uh, might have lactation insufficiency. But since we don't have a drug to do that, uh, we don't replace. Uh, one of the um, things I want to leave you with is treatment of male hypogonadism. You know, treatment of male hypogonadism um, is not just for restoration of normal reproductive function, i.e. A normal libido, a normal erectile function. Um, we can treat either with depot injections, uh, but you get this big peak and valley effect uh, when you give a uh, IM depot injection of testosterone. So these days we prefer the transdermal route, daily administration uh, of a transdermal gel, uh, and that results in a more stable uh, normalization of the testosterone level. Uh, but as I said, the reason to do that, even in males who really have no interest in uh, restoration of uh, normal uh, reproductive function. Uh, we know that both estrogens and testosterone uh, is important for maintaining bone strength and normal bone density. And so if you look at uh, the bone density measurements in this series of hypogonadal males, uh, many of them, or at least a significant fraction of them, uh, have a bone density uh, that puts them at high risk of fracture. And when treatment uh, is initiated and continued with test testosterone, uh, you see uh, in almost all cases an improvement in bone density, uh, a restoration of normal bone health. So when you're thinking about uh, treating hypogonadism, both in males and females, remember there are important effects of restoration of normal estrogen uh, and uh, testosterone levels uh, that are metabolic effects and they are independent uh, of uh, whether there is a desire or need to restore reproductive function uh, in both males and females. Uh, and just something to keep in mind as you are thinking about hormone replacement therapy uh, uh, in males and females.